Hi, I'm Neil Dixon. Welcome to the third video in this tutorial on assembly language. Last time we wrote a simple loop to fill an image with color. To move onward, we'll need a bit more information on how to use image buffers, the condition flags, and functions. In this video, we'll be drawing a rectangle in our image. An image can be thought of as a 2D array of colors, with X being the column number and Y being the row number. In reality, however, these rows are back-to-back -back in memory, forming one long contiguous block. It is often a big advantage to treat an image as a 1D array of this form, as I'll explain in a moment. How do we find the index of the pixel we're looking for? It's just Y times the width plus X. Intuitively, to get down to the beginning of line Y, we'll need to go through all of the pixels in any previous lines. Then we just move across X more pixels. The multiply there can get expensive, though, so recalculating the index for every pixel is usually avoided by some nice properties of the index. Starting at some pixel, we can move to the next one horizontally by adding 1 to the index. We can move vertically by adding the width to the index. If we were instead to use a 2D array, the index would be recalculated from scratch on every pixel. These indices translate nicely into memory addresses, and similar properties allow us to quickly move to the address of the next pixel horizontally or vertically. Remember that our pixels are d-words, 4 bytes each. So adding 4 to the address moves to the next pixel horizontally, and each line is then 4 times width bytes large. This can save having the CPU take extra time to calculate the address but it also makes it clearer how we're moving through memory. Let's see how these properties can translate into code for drawing horizontal and vertical lines. Both start out by figuring out what index to start at, but I've shown them using two different approaches to ending the loop. The horizontal one calculates how many pixels it'll draw, and then counts down to zero. The vertical one calculates what the ending index is, and loops until that index is reached. Each has its advantages and disadvantages, but in this case the countdown is preferable, as we'll see in the actual code. Here's how these can be done in terms of addresses instead of indices. This is generally discouraged in C code, since it is less readable for people who don't understand the code. But in assembly, it doesn't affect readability, since it's all pointer arithmetic anyway. Since we'll be using the countdown approach instead of an end index, Here's that version of the vertical line drawing. Multiplying by 4 is not a major performance concern, since multiplication or division by a power of 2 can be done using bit shifting, shown later. Last time I showed the compare and jump if not equal instructions, but never really explained them. It all starts with something known as condition flags, more often just called the flags. Most instructions that calculate something, set or clear, i.e. make 1 or 0, special flags indicating properties of the result of the operation. For example, the 0 flag indicates whether the last result is 0 or not. The carry flag usually indicates a carry or borrow, which is more useful than it seems, as you'll see on the next slide. The sign flag indicates whether the result is negative, i.e. whether the high order bit, the sign bit, is set. The overflow flag indicates signed overflow. I've also put the parity flag in here, but you probably won't end up using it. So what good are these properties? Well, what the compare instruction really does is a subtraction without saving the result, but it does save the flags. Suppose you subtract two things that are equal, the result is zero. Otherwise, the result is non-zero. This next one's a bit harder to see, so keep in mind that this is for unsigned numbers. Supposing you subtract a larger number, b, from a smaller number, a, there will be a borrow left at the end, indicated with the carry flag. a is below b if and only if there's a carry from the subtraction a minus b. From these, you can also work out conditions for A being above B, and for A not being above B. There are also conditions using the sign flag and overflow flag for signed number comparison, 
but they are a bit more complicated. Each of these ten conditions has an associated jump instruction, where if the condition is true, it will jump to the line label indicated. Notice that some of these have more than one equivalent mnemonic for easier reading. There are also some other instructions that check these conditions, which are very helpful for eliminating jumps, but we probably won't see them in this tutorial unless it's much later on. Ten conditions isn't a very round number in binary, so you can probably guess that there are six more for a total of sixteen. They aren't usually used in conjunction with compare, but they're still useful sometimes, especially the negative versus non-negative check that the sign flag gives. An important thing to remember, though, is that compare is equivalent to sub, but doesn't store the result, and another instruction, test, is equivalent to and, but doesn't save the result. Test is useful for testing whether bits are zero or non-zero. For example, if you have a one-bit boolean to check. I mentioned sub and and test just now, so I should probably explain that those are instructions that accept the same standard set of operands that move and add accept, as shown in the last video. I've also got compare, or, and exclusive or there, since they also accept the same operand types. We won't get into too much bit manipulation in this tutorial, but note that AND is most useful for clearing bits, OR is most useful for setting bits, and exclusive OR is useful for complementing bits. However, the most common use of the XOR instruction is actually to clear a register. Something XOR itself is always zero. It saves a few bytes of code over moving zero into the register, and this is done so often that there's special handling in the CPU to make that case faster. Sorry for blasting through some more bit operations on this slide. If people would like a video on bit manipulation with examples, I could make one later on, but for the moment it's assumed that you have some basic knowledge of bit operations. Bit shifting, apart from just shifting bits within an operand, can be used to multiply or divide it by a power of 2 much faster than using the mul or div instructions, as you'll see in a moment. Shifting left by n bits using SHL is equivalent to multiplying by 2 to the n. The low bits shifted in are all zero. You can shift by a constant number of bits, or by the number of bits specified in CL. CL is the low order byte of ECX, as we'll see more in later videos. Shifting right by n bits using SHR is equivalent to dividing by 2 to the n, but only for unsigned numbers or positive signed numbers. The high bits shifted in are again zero. For signed numbers, we probably want to keep the sign the same after shifting, which is indicated by the topmost bit, and it turns out that copying in the sign bit instead of zeros maintains the property of dividing by a power of 2. This can be done with the SAR instruction. Note that the division here always rounds down. This means that 3 shift right 1 equals 1, and negative 3 SAR 2 equals negative 2, not negative 1, as would be the case if it was truncated towards 0. I've shown an awful lot of instructions this time, so it's okay if you don't remember them all right now. You'll get to know them by using them. There won't be many more instructions used in this tutorial. Just two more here to round out this set. Mull and div are rather complicated in that they have a different implicit operand depending on the size of the explicitly specified operand. When multiplying an 8-bit number by AL, the low byte of EAX, the result is 16 bits put into AX, the low word of EAX. Note that AX also contains AL, so AL is also modified by the instruction. We'll be using mul with a 32-bit operand, w in which case the result is 64 bits, with the high 32 bits being put into EDX, 
and the low 32 bits being put into EAX. Div is nearly the reverse of mul. When given a 32-bit operand, it tries to divide the 64 bits of EDX EAX by this operand. If the result fits into 32 bits, which is usually the case, it is stored in EAX. But if it doesn't fit into 32 bits, an error occurs. This is most often called a divide by zero error, but it can occur when dividing by something other than zero if the numerator is large enough and the denominator is small enough. Okay, so I said that we were going to draw a rectangle in our image this time. So again, we're starting from scratch. And we just have our image here empty. So what do we want to start with? Well, first, let's define some constants determining where a rectangle is going to be. Constants. Okay. So let's name this x0. And with the value and this is the left x-coordinate, and x1, let's have it at 60, and this is the right x-coordinate. y0, likewise. Let's put it at 5. This is the top y coordinate. And y1, 40, the bottom y coordinate. Okay. And let's put a color in there too. Let's make it orange. Okay, so now we know where our rectangle is going to be. Let's start by trying to draw one line, just the top line. Okay, so we want to have the y coordinate in a register. So, yes, it is going to be our y for this top line, and we want to multiply this y coordinate by the width to get the start of that line. Then we want to add our x-coordinate to that to get the index of the first pixel. Okay, so let's calculate the address of that index now by shifting left eax2 which multiplies it by 4, so EAX is 4 times the index, and then adding the address of the pixel. So add EAX, ECX. So now EAX is going to be the address of the bitmap, plus 4 times the index, this being the address of the first pixel that we're going to draw. Now I mentioned before that we're going to be doing a countdown. So let's put that in EDX and the countdown we want is going to be x1 minus x0 and that is the number of pixels in our line. 
Okay. So now here we're going to want to set a pixel. So we have the address of it already, and it's a D word. We have into EAX. We want to put the color and move to the next pixel. And here we're going to decrement our count. Now, if we're on the last iteration, then this decrement will go to zero. So we want to jump if it's not zero. Let's call the line label next top pixel. And we want to go back to where we're setting a new pixel. Set top pixel. There we go. Okay. Now the other ones are very similar to this, but there's one thing to notice. We've modified EAX, and we want to use the width for all of them. So let's save EAX into another register. So let's put it into ESI. Okay. So the bottom for the bottom we want it at y1 and remember we want to restore eax that we just saved okay so now we have the two horizontal lines and let's make two vertical lines Okay, so we need to again here restore EAX uh, from. Oops. Here we go. EAX ESI, so restoring EAX. Now we want this first one, let's say it's the left one. So we're again starting at Y0, X0. The count this time is going to be y1 minus y0, since it's vertical. And we also want to have the increment be 4 times width instead of 4. So let's pre-calculate what that increment is going to be. And let's use ebx, since we're not using it here yet. So in EBX, let's move the width, which is in ESI, and shift it left 4, or rather 2, so that we multiply by 4. And then we want to add EBX to EAX in this loop. So we want to do the same thing in the second loop. We're again starting at Y0 but starting at x1 and the number of pixels is that and the increment is the same as before oops, I forgot to copy this and right pixel okay, and we want to add ebx to eax there we go now I've gone through it, quite a bit of stuff here, so let's make sure that this works, and it may in fact not work. Okay, good. Let's assemble. Okay, and link. Okay, and the image program. Okay. Let's try running this. I've just got a, a blank input bitmap, 64 by 64. And there we go. We have our output bitmap. Let's see this. Oh, it looks like we've got an off by one error here in the height. Let's see. Okay. I want minus y 
zero. Ah yes, if we want to draw the last pixel at the ending coordinate, we need to draw one more pixel, because otherwise we end just before the last pixel. In some cases you might not want to draw this pixel, but in our case we do. Okay, so let's just make sure that that works. And there we go. That pixel is now in there. Good. Okay, so now we've got a lot of code duplication here. The code is almost exactly the same for these several things. So let's make a function. Let's start with horizontal line. Horizontal line. Okay. Now we of course need to return from this function. That's what this ret does. And uh, we will eventually need to call it, of course. But let's figure out what should go into this function. So the things this function needs are the width. Let's keep that in ESI, as we seem to have it. It needs the address of the bitmap. Uh, we've got that in ECX bitmap. It needs the Y coordinate. Uh, let's use EDX for it. It needs the X coordinate. Now, we want some scratch registers, so let's use something else for the X coordinate. Make that uh, EDI. And the number of pixels can be in EBX, as we've got it already. Oh, wait. No, no, we haven't been using it for that yet. But let's try it. Okay. So what do we need to do first? Well, we want to do the same calculation as before. We want to... Let's just copy this. Um, yeah, that's one of the horizontal line ones. And let's see, we've got our width in ESI. We want to multiply by EDX, so this is already set. And we want to add to EAX EDI, which is now our X0. We want to shift left EAX2 still, and add the address of the bitmap. Now we've already got EDX set to the number of pixels we want, so we don't need to set it again. And we set our color, we increment the address, and we decrement our counter. And then we return. So let's just rename this here, since it's not just the bottom anymore. And notice that it updated there. Some nice refactoring features in this. OK, so how would we call this? Well, some of these things we've already got set. But we need to set some of them before calling. So here we've set ESI to the width. And we still need to set edx to be y0 and our edi to be x0 and in this case our number of pixels ebx is going to be x1 minus x0 okay so now to call the function we say call horizontal line and we can make the second horizontal line like that as well. Can do, in fact, I'll copy this. And the only difference is the y. 
Okay, so now we've got horizontal line. Now what about vertical lines? So let's, ah oh yes, the plus one. So we can delete these. Now for vertical lines. Let's make a separate vertical line function because there's not quite as much in common between horizontal and vertical lines. So vertical line and it again needs to return which is what red does. And it also needs a number of these things. So let's copy this comment here. Oops. Okay, so it still needs the width. It needs the address of the bitmap. In this case, not everything's on the same y, so let's call it y0. And everything is on the same x. And we still have the number of pixels. Okay, so this needs to do a bit different stuff than the horizontal line, but not too much different. So let's again copy what we have for the vertical lines. And okay. So we've already set EDX. We want to add EDI. And shift left, we add. We've set e EDX already, which is now our EBX. Ah, yes. I missed that in the previous function. We're now using EBX for the number of pixels. Likewise here. As uh, noted here, EBX is now the number of pixels instead of EDX. And so that means that we need to use a different register for calculating the width times 4. Okay, so now again this is any pixel. So this should return, it should loop and return, and that should be okay. So again to call this, we'll need to set edx to y not and edi to x not move edx and this time it's the number of pixels is the delta y plus one and we want to call vertical line there we go and in this case the only difference is the x coordinate. Okay, so now we can delete these. Good. So let's try this out. delete the output file, just to make sure. And there we go. We have the same output. And this time, we've saved a bit of code by having these functions in here. In the next episode, we'll be looking back at general registers and the flags, but learning about the stack using flood fill.